So let's then uh, continue on uh, this example. We have seen how to uh, uh, update the values for S and G each time you get a new data point. These values are measured values or given from uh, well, some source that you will find out that the actual demand in period number one was 200. The S and the G are the values which uh, describes the latest development of the trend line, the latest value of the intercept of the line and the latest gradient or the slope of the line. And then you need to adjust these two values according to what did you what was the actual demand in in the period. And when you have adjusted values, it's easy to make a new forecast for the next period by adding the S and the G values together. And if you want to make a forecast for even further periods ahead, you might have to multiply by this tau value, which describes the number of periods in advance. How much, uh, how many periods you want to make a forecast uh, uh, from the current date. Uh, this Excel sheet uh, describes the same uh, problem. And here we have the, the failures, the data points, 200 and 250, as we uh, remember. The S and the G values are calculated here by the formulas we have seen here. And we also here remember the values from we, what we did on the blackboard. And then the forecast is shown here. And now we include one new data point at a time. And these uh, formulas are cop uh, copied with the uh, cell references. So every time we get a new data point, we will have updated value for S and G, and then easily a new value for the forecast for the next period. Here we are also showing the MAD and the MSE, the forecast errors, the absolute error and the squared error, to see how far away from the actual demand our forecast was. So this Excel sheet will, uh, as usual, be uploaded uh, in front there just after the lecture, and you can see how to use Excel or another type of, of spreadsheet to, to create uh, models uh, like this. And each time you get a new data point, or if you change the value here, you can see that the, uh, the values for the, uh, the series and the, and the gradient and also the forecast will, uh, will change. Uh, the second part here is to forecast all the coming periods from this particular period. So we have updated one at a time until period number three. And then you make a forecast for period four, five, six, and so on by the values you have in period number three. Uh, and then you can see that you will add the gradient value 9.6 every time. 9.6 plus 9.6 and so on. You will continue with the same slope on the trend line as you had in the time where you actually are forecasting from. So this is an, uh, well, it's an Excel sheet which shows the same example as I have started on on, on, the, on the blackboard uh, and also is uh, described in, in the textbook. So I will make one more example on, uh, on, on this HALTS method. Um, this is uh, this, uh, a problem from the textbook, problem number 230 on page 78, uh, which is the same data as we have seen in an earlier example. This is uh, uh, visitors to a park and you, we use the same example on the when looking at uh, the regression analysis so.
we have values for for the uh, well we found values for the uh, regression line and by using these values it could be uh, will be quite easy to estimate the value of the series and also the gradient at the end of the time period which is period number six in this case because the uh, problem text uh, says that uh, we have the actual number of visit visitors during the, the park in, in, um, in July, which is new, and we have new values for, for July and, and August, and we should use the values we have found by the regression example at the end of June to update this uh, uh, forecast by using uh, Holt's uh, method. So, we remember regression line was D, of t uh, or the d of hat of t to uh, to see that this is not the actual demand but this is the uh, estimated demand on the trend line by looking at only the the trend line this is not the real value but the estimated value it should be equal to the a value which was minus eight hundred and seven point four plus the B value, which was 500.59, uh, multiplied by T. This is uh, problem number 2.30 on page 78. Seventy-eight in the textbook. So now we have earlier found the values of the regression line and we will now use the current values to make a forecast and update the method by using Holt's method. So here, quite easy, we know that t is equal to 6 because this is the value of June, month number 6, and this means that the estimated demand should be minus 807.4 plus 500.59 multiplied by 6 which will give you a value of 2195.84 and this is now also similar to the S value for let's call that period number zero because now we are starting all over again this was the regression line from period zero to six the first six months of the year now we are in the end of June we have um, uh, we have uh, uh, parameter values and we want to update the model with the new data point we will find in, in July and, and August. So the S0 value will be similar to the, this value, the end point of the line, and the G0 value is the same as 500.59. This is the slope of the line. So we have found this line to be the best fit up to this point and now we define a new period zero for the new method with the s point here and the g point as the gradient or the slope of the line and the values are as shown here we are also given values for the alpha and the beta smoothing constant Alpha is said to be 0 0.15 and beta is 0 0.10. This is given. And uh, also when you are going to calculate, uh, well, use this method in, in examples and so on, uh, you will be given or uh, at least uh, asked for. It's not easy to, to find exact values for this smoothing constant because this means uh, analyzing and looking at historical data and also well, you need uh, 
th there is no exact formula to, to, to find out values for uh, these values. You have to find out what, what is best in your particular case. <coughs> so let's now, we can use the same, we will of course use the same formulas and we can also use the same table. Uh, we have, yeah, D is not important, but we have the S value, which is 2195.84, and we have the G value, which is 500.59. And we can then easily find the forecast for the first period, and since we know this is the end of June, we can make a forecast for July. And according to this model we have now, the forecast for July will be this value plus this value, which will be a total of 2614.42. No, 54. Is that correct? Yeah, it should be 50, 54, so I was a bit inaccurate here. Like this. Okay, we now have values for S0, G0, and a forecast for period number one. Then the well, problem text states that we will get a new value, a new demand in July, which now is period number one, which was 2150. A bit smaller than the forecast. And that means this line, which we thought was going to continue in the, with the same gradient, will be adjusted down because what we thought should be a demand up here will actually end up here. Or even it will be actually no increase because we had the S value of 2195 and this value is actually smaller. So the new value will be down here. And that means that the estimated values will probably end up somewhere between here. We have to adjust down the line, the trend line, and the value of the intercept S, and also the gradient, the uh, slope of, of the line. So with these new values, 2150, we can find S1 as the alpha value, 0 0.15, multiplied by 2150, plus 0 0.85, 1 minus 0 0.15, and multiplied by the previous forecast, which was this value, 2696.38. And then the new value of the series, the S1 value, will be 26. 14.42. Still, we will expect that the line will increase because the previous forecast has a relatively much higher weight than the one new data point here, 85% versus 15%, but the value of S will be smaller than we actually have found, uh, or what, what was the forecast here. So we will have to adjust down when we see that the demand was smaller than we, uh, than we did expect. The G value will also be smaller because the G of T, or the G1 now in our case, will be the beta value, and here we have given the value of 0 0.10, 
multiplied by the difference of the s values, the difference of this value and this value. And plus 0 0.9, which is 1 minus 0 0.10, and multiplied by the previous value of g, 500.54. And calculating this, we will end up with a G1 value of 492.34. A smaller value. The gradient, the trend line, will be adjusted down since the actual demand was much smaller than we expected. We need to adjust down. And then for making a forecast for August, we will instead, for following this line, have to follow this line. Which means we add the series and the gradient value and end up with a forecast of 2000, no, 3106.76. But this is also smaller than we would have if we were continuing here. We can try to add the gradient from here, 500.54 multiplied by 2 to this value. And then you find out that you will be uh, approximately 3,200. So here, the forecast for August have been uh, uh, adjusted down since we have a what we can say a bad value here. A, well, the poorer uh, or less visitors than you had expected. And again, in August, it turns out to be 2,660, which is uh, higher than the previous one, but still. Uh, it is uh, not as much as the forecast. It is uh, approximately the same or slightly higher than the actual value of the series. So here we will end up around here. Uh, not there, but uh, uh, around the, the series here. On almost the same value as the series value of the last uh, period. In this case, 2660. Again, update the values of S, 0 0.15 multiplied by the new value, 2660, plus 0 0.85 multiplied by the previous forecast, 3106, and it will give us now a value of 3039.75. And the gradient will be the smoothing constant of 10% multiplied by the difference between the two previous series values, this one minus this one, and plus 0 0.90 multiplied by the previous value of the gradient, which was 492.34. And a new value of the gradient will then be 485.64. This one. So we can see here that the measures or the exact data for July and August was smaller than we had expected, which means that the gradient will decrease. This, this one will be lower than the previous, and this is even lower than the previous one. But the series line is still increasing because you still have a positive gradient. You are still expecting more visitors in the next period than you did in the previous one. And this will continue until the gradient value will become negative. When the gradient becomes negative, it means that the trend line will start to decrease. <coughs> Uh, 
Uh, we are also asked to make a forecast for uh, September and October. Uh, yeah, I can just show. Uh, I also have a solution in, in Word for, for this example, which was this one. I don't have to, to write uh, everything on, on the blackboard, but, but you can study this, um, uh, this um, solution, which will be, uh, be uploaded in Fronter as the other documents I show on the, on the lectures. Uh, and here we can see that the one step ahead forecast made in August for September will be S2 plus uh, G2. S2 is at uh -huh, 35, 25 should be approximately the uh, correct here. And then we can also make a two step ahead forecast from August for October, which will be the S2 value plus two times the gradient value, since we are forecasting for two periods in uh, ahead. So 30, 40 plus two times. Uh, yeah, of course, this is from from uh, from. Uh, uh, from August, and this is uh, rounded, so this is 30, yeah, 39.75, approximately 33,040, uh, 3, multiplied by two times the gradient, and we'll end up with 4,011.4. And the next question was uh, to what is the forecast made at the end of July for the number of park attendees in December? So the end of July is actually end of period one here, since period zero was June, this is July. And to make a forecast for December in July, then we should use the data we have in July, which this is the S value, this is the G value, and since we want to make a forecast for December, will be five times or five periods ahead and end up with a forecast of 5,077. Because here we don't have new data. When we get new data, this model has to be uh, adjusted and the values of the series and the gradient needs to be adjusted. But when you are forecasting further periods ahead, you have to uh, assume that the gradient value will be the same as the current uh, value because you don't have any other data. Uh, so, now we have seen examples on first stationary series. We saw the moving averages method. We saw the, uh, we saw the, uh, the exp exponential smoothing method or the single exponential smoothing method when you only had one smoothing constant alpha. And then we saw method for uh, trend-based series, first regression analysis, find a formula like this, and then the double exponential smoothing or HALTS method where you are updating the series and the gradient value after each new data point, like we now just have seen, and then we have a trend, a method to try to, uh, to, uh, to forecast a trend into the future. But uh, well, thinking of the, the last example, visitors to a park, is it, uh, well, can you expect to have an increasing trend here? Will the visitors number of visitors continue to, uh, to increase in August, September, October, November, December? Well, maybe not. And this is, uh, could be an example of what you call a situation where you have uh, not only trends, but you also have seasons. There might be more visitors in the summer season than in the winter season. And you can also have other products where this is the case. Uh, well, selling ice cream, for example. Certainly you sell more ice cream in the summer when it's nice weather than in the winter season. Some products might be very popular for Christmas presents. And then you will have a very high sales 
in November and certainly in December and not so much sales in the rest of the year. And you have lots of other products which is depends on, uh, on the season. And now we will start looking at uh, uh, methods where we can also predict or try to, to predict the uh, development of, of the sale or the forecast when you have seasonal differences. And here we are, well, ha have explained something about seasonality. Uh, it corresponds to uh, a pattern in the data that repeats at regular intervals. And you might have seasonal factors, which here is described as the C values for a certain or a given number of seasons, here given as N. The seasons can be, mm, well, month are one obvious example. January, February until December, you have seasons in month. You have the winter season versus the summer season. You might have four seasons, winter, spring, summer, and, uh, and the fall. Uh, so th there might be uh, different uh, ways in different markets to, to split up the full, uh, full year or the full sales period into uh, seasons. But what is, uh, uh, is similar is that you find a multiplicative uh, factor here denoted as the C factor, which should be multiplied by the expected value according to a non-seasonal uh, series. So here we show an example that the C of one particular uh, season, the, the seasonal factor here is 1.25, which implies that you will have 25% higher sales than the baseline on average. What you expect if you didn't have any season. And the second example, if you have 0 0.75, means that you have only 75% of the baseline or 25% lower than the baseline on average. Also, what is uh, very central here, the sum of the seasonal factors should always be equal to the number of seasons. Here we have only two seasons, 1.25 plus 0 0.75 is 2. This is very important that you will always sum up the seasonal factors to the exact number of seasons. And here we can see an example where you have seasons, you start here and you have six uh, you can see that these peaks are in the same seasons and you have uh, with five, uh, five uh, periods of, of difference here, you have a low sales and similar you have a high, uh, high sales here in period number four and period number nine and period number uh, 14. Uh, so here we have regularly uh, seasonals, which, uh, seasons, which is uh, repeated, and of course they will not reach the same point. This seems to be higher than the previous one, and this is certainly lower than the two previous ones. But you still have a, a peak in the demand for uh, the regular uh, repeating um, uh, seasons here. <coughs> and what we first should look out uh, for is a very simple method called exactly the simple method in the textbook and in these slides it's called the, the quick and dirty method of estimating seasonal factors. This is the case where you don't have similar trends. We will come back later to see when, uh, see example, when you have seasons along a trend line because Trends and season can be uh, combined, that's uh, quite often uh, the case in uh, looking at uh, different products. Uh, so then you might have seasonal s factors which varies along, along this, in this case, increasing trend line. But uh, this quick and dirty or the simple method don't include trends. So it is only based on seasons 
which varies along, along a baseline which is uh, horizontal here, looking like this. So, first describe this quite uh, quite easy and then uh, uh, and then show an example. Uh, we should compute the sample mean of the entire data set, find the average value of all the data points you are including. Uh, you should have at least several seasons, of course. You should have be able to, to look uh, a bit into the, the past to find these uh, uh, representative seasonal factors. Then you should divide each observation by the sample mean. This will give a factor for each observation. And then average the factors for the like periods in a season. So, if we, for example, in the previous example, we saw that we had two seasons, one of a seasonal factor of 1.25, another one with 0 0.75, we can look at the next full period and see that the similar values for the winter and the summer season might be 1.30 and 0 0.70. And then you need to find the average of the factors of the like periods in a season. So in this very small example, average of 130 and 125, and average of 0 0.70 and 0 0.75, since you have two full periods, two, two full years. So, So now let's look at one similar example with two periods and two full seasons. And uh, we have uh, a winter and a summer season. Or what we actually do here, there's some confusion about the, the term season, but uh, the textbook uses the season as the, the full season or the full year, for example and you have periods within a season. So you have the winter period in the season and the summer period in the, the, the same season. So here we have demand for two full years, two full seasons. Let's call now the season one and season two. And you have the winter and the summer. And if we now assume that in the winter period in season one, you have 16.2 as the demand. In the summer period, you have 22.5. And in the next year, the next full season, you have a winter demand of 17.3. And a summer demand of 23.5. What we now should try to do, find the sample mean of the entire data set, which is uh, the sum of all these divided by n, which is 16.2 plus 17.3 plus 22 plus the point 0.5 and plus 23.5 divided by 4, the total number of data points. Uh, which means 79.5 divided by 4, which is 19.875. And now we have this as called the the average D. This is the average of all the four data points, all the four measured values we have here. 19.875. Next, 
divide each observation by the sample mean. Each observation divided by 19.875. And then we can find the factors, which now will be the call that W1 and S1 as the winter and the summer factor. 16.2 uh, divided by 19.875 should be 0 0.815. 22.5 divided by the 19.875 should be 1.132. And for the next full season, 17.3 divided by 19.875 is 0 0.843. And at last, 23.5 divided by the same average D should be 1.157. And then we can find what we call the S factors. And the S factors will now be the average of the similar values. The average of the factors for the like periods in a season. And the average of the winter factors will then be 0 0.84, uh, of course, this one was not exactly correct, because this one should be 0 0.870. And this one should be 1.182. And then we can find the average as the S factors for the SW, the winter seasonal factor, will be the average of these two values, 0 0.843. And the summer factor will be the average of these two values, which is 1.157. And we can see that these two values will add up to 2. So we have a sum of the seasonal factors will always be, or should always be, sometimes we have to adjust them, but they should always be equal to the number of seasons. So now, if you want to make a forecast for next year, we have two years of data, winter and summer, and the new forecast for the new year. Let's now have a forecast for, or the, let's call it the forecast for the winter season and a forecast for the summer season. In this case, the forecast when we have, we don't expect to have a trend, so we have a baseline looking like this. And the forecast will be the baseline multiplied by the seasonal factor. The baseline is, uh, uh, has the value of the average demand, 19.875, and multiplied by the seasonal factor, 0.843, and 1.157. So here, the forecast for the winter period in the next season will be 19.875 multiplied by 0 0.843, which is 16.75. And for the summer season, the same Average demand multiplied by the summer factor of 1.157 should be exactly 23. This is now the forecast for the two uh, periods in the next full season, the winter and the summer period. So here, this is well, what we call the quick and dirty method in the slide or the simple method in the textbook.
Well, we have other methods. This is a very, as the name uh, also indicates, this is a very simple method, but it's uh, also used to, uh, to show uh, the principles of this uh, uh, seasonal forecasting method. And we should now look at another method called the, the n-period moving average. Moving average is uh, now a familiar term. We have used the moving average technique earlier. And now we should also include <coughs> seasonal factors in the moving average uh, technique. So, before we take a break, I will just show a Word file which describes this n-period moving average. Yeah. You can start looking. This is also, of course, described in, in the textbook, but this is a way to, to show this, uh, uh, this uh, n-period moving average technique by one step at a time. And after the break, we will uh, We'll look at uh, an example of this technique and try to make a forecast for a period when you have different season. Well, for a, for a season when you have different periods and different uh, seasonal factors. But then, 15 minutes break and then we continue.